once again, everyone, I just want to say welcome to session 14 of the Data Science Fellowship Program. This session is going to be focused on machine learning. And so today I have started us off with a talk that's going to sort of introduce some of the concepts that we will be delving into in greater detail throughout the session this week. So I'm going to start with an incredibly basic question, which is, what is machine learning? And I actually found that the following figure is the most useful I have ever seen in terms of a quick and uh, simplified understanding of what's going on. So in the picture here, you can see that uh, we have this large bubble that is artificial intelligence, or what I will refer to as AI moving forward. And machine learning is a subset of that. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning, as I'll explain in a little bit more detail. Okay, So machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. As a field, the goal of AI is to develop computers and machines that are capable of demonstrating any form of intelligence. Okay. So during the first major wave of AI development uh, over 50 years ago, this was all focused on a field at the time that was known as symbolic AI. Right? The idea behind symbolic AI is that you can essentially hard code a set of rules or a set of governing behavior that can replicate intelligence. Okay. So um, basically you have a machine that just can recognize different forms of input and based on those inputs that then triggers some specific uh, hard-coded rule for a, uh, a version of output. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing many of you are not old enough, but I played some very old uh, computer chess video games in my life and these were all based on symbolic AI. So here's a screen grab of a very, very old version of Microsoft Windows, the chess video game that you could play with this. And basically the way that the symbolic AI was developed was every possible or a very large set of the possible moves that could be made during a game of chess were literally coded line by line into the machine. And then the machine would understand, okay, based on move that the user just made, I must now make the following move. So pawn goes here, rook goes there, knight goes there, etc. And this was basically for every possible iteration of what could be done on the chessboard. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> imagine for a moment that we take this, this regime, this idea of symbolic AI, but we wanna build something more than just, you know, here's a bunch of rules for how you respond to different moves in a game of chess. Uh, instead, we want to replicate human intelligence, right? Well, what would that ultimately look like? So you might have uh, some input, right? A human says, what's up, right? So now the computer responds, nothing much. A human says, what's up, dog? And now the computer responds, how's it hanging, daddy-o? Or a human says, was up? And now the computer is to respond, hey, buddy. Okay, this is just uh, a, a somewhat silly, but uh, I think representative example of how incredibly difficult it would be to actually develop symbolic AI and make it look anything like general intelligence, right? Because here we have a bunch of rules uh, for responding to essentially a simple input from a user, what's up? A question that is asked daily by many all over the world. Uh, and yet, because there are slight variations and iterations on the way that one could ask the question, what's up? That means that there needs to be several different ways that a computer might respond, okay? So um, it is possible, I contend, to imagine that it would be, uh, capable, that humans would be capable, excuse me, of writing millions and millions of lines of code in order to develop something that replicates an intelligent machine. Um, at the same time, I would also contend that this machine would never really truly replicate general intelligence in any meaningful way, um, because there would be a total lack of creativity 
if everything is just sort of hard coded, right? There's a single path every time an input comes from some user or other stimulus uh, in terms of what happens next from the output of the machine. And yet this was at the forefront of AI and there were many researchers uh, in AI that thought that symbolic AI was actually going to generate general intelligence, intelligence that would even surpass that of a typical human being, okay? Um, so uh, symbolic AI is built on the standard paradigm of computer programming, right? Anytime we write a computer program, we essentially are just laying out some set of rules, right? We say, okay, uh, here's some input. Here is an image I took of a galaxy. I want to measure the brightness of that galaxy. Or uh, here is a list of measurements that I have made of masses of different galaxies, right? We have some set and we're essentially passing that input and the computer then has a set of rules, right? So the rule may be, okay, take the image, measure the brightness. Or the rule may be take all the mass measurements and determine the mass function. So um, with the rules and the inputs, the processing is done by the computer in order to provide some set of answers. Right? And what this means is that there is a deterministic output for every input. And I contend that's a pretty standard form of computing. And that's how symbolic AI works. Okay? Machine learning is a very significant shift from this design. Okay? At a very basic level, when we use machine learning algorithms, instead of providing rules to the computer, what we are doing is providing the computer with both the input, okay, so here's the data that's gonna go in, and we're also providing the output. Okay? In many cases, machine learning is used for classification. So we're providing input, here's the data, and then here's the class that various sources belong to. And what we're now asking the computer to do is to devise the set of rules. How do we go from the input to the output, okay? And in this way, machine learning, unlike all of AI, machine learning is very good at solving problems where the input output relationship is not particularly well understood. And so machine learning goes beyond symbolic AI, okay? because we are asking the computer to learn relationships within the data and to learn rules that we otherwise do not know how to write down explicitly a priori, okay? And like I just said, this means that machine learning is an exceptionally powerful tool for classification. And a lot of the huge gains uh, that have occurred over the last several years have been in using machine learning methods to solve classification problems. Okay. Uh, and then we'll come back to this, but deep learning, which was the sort of smallest bubble subset of AI and machine learning is a uh, relatively new, but also totally dominant uh, way to use machine learning methods. So relatively new, meaning it's not even really 10 years old at this point, uh, but it is also where most of the activity in the field of computer science is going and also where I think most of the effort in astronomy is gonna be focused over the coming years, okay? And briefly, uh, deep learning emphasizes the construction of several layers of meaningful representations of the data. Uh, if that totally sounds like gibberish to you right now, that's entirely fine. We have several lectures that are devoted to this over the course of the rest of the week. And so all of this will be defined in more detail later. Okay. So if I wanted to use the 10 hundred most common words in the English language, uh, I would describe machine learning as um, making computers recognize information. Uh, and if we wanna be a little bit more technical, um, I often think of machine learning as I'm just sort of thinking, you know, very broadly and very basically about what's possible with machine learning as extremely complex pattern recognition algorithms. Okay? And many places in this very famous te textbook by Christopher Bishop and elsewhere, uh, you will find that machine learning is, is often referred to as being analogous in many ways to pattern recognition. Again, the basic idea is that we have data, we have some representation 
of our data, uh, which becomes our inputs. And that goes into our machine learning algorithm. And we essentially learn how to recognize patterns within that data to then make classifications or to predict outcomes of some kind. Um, so uh, I also think, and this is a point that I like to uh, really emphasize every time I'm teaching about machine learning, uh, that it's very important to think of machine learning as an engineering task, okay? So as we said earlier, the computer is under the hood learning rules to connect inputs to outputs, right? What the computer is not doing is learning a fundamental understanding, right? So like here is a physical equation that explains why if I have such and such inputs, this is the likely output or this is going to be the output, okay? Uh, we have very little means, we have very little tools for actually understanding the rules that are derived by machine learning algorithms. Um, there are some very simplistic algorithms that are interpretable, uh, but those algorithms are also uh, some of the least powerful when it comes to actual performance at things like classification tasks, okay? So as a result, I tend to think of machine learning as an engineering task. Um, I will note, and we'll also talk about this later this week as well, uh, there are a lot of people much smarter than I that are thinking about how we can extend these things in order to better develop our inference while still using a lot of the power that is available from machine learning methods. And so um, I do think that there is progress that's being made there. But nevertheless, fundamentally with machine learning, what we are doing is engineering of some kind. We're trying to figure out outputs based on the input of our data. All right, um, all of that being said, I think that you should all be extremely excited if you aren't already about machine learning and deep learning. And I think that this particular image provides a really good summary of that. Uh, so if you can't see my mouse, I'm just gonna describe essentially what I'm looking at. But this particular plot shows the error rate in an annual data challenge called the ImageNet classification problem. ImageNet's a very famous data set. Uh, uh, it's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of images. And the aim of the algorithm that uh, various researchers are developing is to classify what they see in the image. And one would, I mean, think about this literally as just taking random images off of a Google image search. It literally is everything. There's pictures of cats, dogs, horses, cars, houses, people, et cetera. And the aim is to basically minimize the error rate in terms of classifying what is actually present within an image. And you can see that even as little as uh, approximately a decade ago in 2010, the very best models had an uncertainty, right? They would get classifications wrong more than 30% of the time. Okay, and the big leap, the big leap that happened was in the year 2012, the first uh, deep neural network or convolutional neural network was used. And you can see in the middle of the plot, there's a huge jump, right? So there was something approaching a plateau in sort of traditional machine learning methods at a classification error rate of about 30%. And then there was a, a huge jump from about 30 all the way down to about 15% in 2012. And uh, this jump was so significant that it inspired basically all other research teams to start working on the same deep learning techniques as well. And you can see that in 2013, the error rates for every method were now below 30%, this sort of previous plateau that had been reached. And in the following years, the error rates continued to drop by a few percentage points every year. And in fact, 2015, I think is a, a landmark year in terms of the uh, strength and ability of deep learning models to classify data because it was in 2015 that for the first time, and there were many different groups, Microsoft, uh, Google, et cetera, that were able to build models that could beat human classification. So at the upper right corner of this plot, you can see that the uh, humans have about a 5% error rate on this ImageNet uh, classification data set. And at first blush, I know that it sounds like, wait, one in 20 images are misclassified by a human, how can that be? And again, this comes back to the, the sheer breadth of this data set. So just to give you a sense, uh, 
not only are there tons and tons of pictures of dogs, but there are actually more than a hundred different breeds of dog that are represented in the data set. And so uh, you can imagine that with such a sprawling data set with many different types of things that can be classified, even humans will fail to get some of those classifications correct. And uh, you know, state of the art now on the ImageNet is uh, error rates of a few percent, okay? So what this means, right? What this means is that with the advent of deep learning, right? <clears throat> machine learning methods in general have surpassed humans at 2D image recognition tasks, right? Again, I cannot emphasize how challenging of a problem this is. And we'll talk about this very specific problem more over the course of this week. But imagine for a moment building a symbolic AI model, right? You're gonna write down all the rules necessary in order to classify just something as simple as like, that's a picture of a horse, right? Uh, this is actually a really, really, really complex task. You have to come up with all kinds of ways to say, okay, you know, that looks like a head, but it's a horse head, not a human head. And it's also not a cow head, it's a horse head. Uh, and uh, writing down these rules one by one is incredibly complicated. And in fact, that's where the field was largely uh, prior to the advent of deep learning, okay? Uh, and there's a lot of incredible accomplishments that have occurred in the realm of machine learning over the past several years, right? Uh, Self-driving cars. I have been uh, uh, endlessly fascinated by the fact that we actually have robots uh, that with pretty good efficacy can drive a car over a variety of different circumstances and in a variety of different environments. Um, we also have near human level speech recognition Right, so uh, many of us in our phones, laptops, tablets, you can push a button and talk to a computer and that computer can actually basically understand everything that you're saying to it, okay? Mach machine translation has made uh, huge improvements over the last several years. So you can walk into a foreign country, there can be some street sign, you have no idea what it says, or uh, you hold up your phone, take a picture, and then on your phone suddenly be able to read uh, what you're looking at in your language of choice. Right? Um, digital assistants are incredibly powerful. And uh, on the back end of all of those uh, is um, machine learning algorithms. Okay? And uh, another thing that's, that I find very, very fascinating, and there's a link in the slides here that you can go watch on your own. But um, a few years ago, very famously, a group called the DeepMind was able to build a machine learning algorithm that could play the game Go. And if you're not familiar, Go is like a significantly more uh, complex strategy game than the game of chess. Um, it could play the game Go better than the world's grand masters. So this is basically actually a machine seeming to replicate human intelligence, okay? Um, so I now wanna ask a question. All right, uh, with all of these amazing accomplishments that have happened in machine learning in the last several years, did we all make a mistake? Uh, should none of us actually be sitting here working towards astronomy PhDs? Um, should we in fact be quitting and devoting all of our energy and effort towards machine learning? Uh, and uh, I just wanna say that while the games are incredible, uh, there is also still a lot of work to be done, right? So um, we do have self-driving cars, uh, but those self-driving cars have also led to several very tragic accidents, okay? So the progress is incredible. And uh, I think there are many applications for us in astronomy, uh, but I don't think that anyone has been wasting their time by being in an astro PhD program, okay? Um, I also want to just quickly note that uh, AI has undergone uh, rap rapid periods of development in the past. So uh, symbolic AI was hugely important uh, many decades ago. And then it was sort of realized that symbolic AI was not actually going to generate general intelligence. Um, and so these periods are called periods of dis disillusionment and sometimes uh, less interest in researchers as well as less funding from funding bodies, these are referred to as an AI winter. And there's been a few of these. So uh, there was the symbolic AI in like the 50s and 60s. Uh, there was a whole area of uh, so-called intelligent machines in the 70s and 80s, which was very similar to symbolic AI, but computers were also more powerful at the time. So you could hard code more rules. Uh, that also sort of 
fell out of favor. Uh, and now we're sort of very much in the height of excitement about deep learning, okay? Um, all that being said though, I think it's pretty clear at this point that deep learning is here to stay. So there's a lot of hype and excitement. Uh, some of the promise, right, going back to something like a self-driving car, some of that promise may not be fulfilled and it may not be fulfilled on immediate time scales. So we may be in store for another AI winter. But some of the progress has been uh, so clearly useful in our day-to-day -day lives, again, thinking about things like digital assistance, that the techniques and the methods that go into developing deep learning uh, are gonna become increasingly important, both in our everyday lives and in astronomy as a field. So I think it's critically important that all of you have some understanding of how these methods work. Okay. Um, we will be focused on understanding the how of machine learning. How do we take data and build machine learning models with that data, okay? Before we dive into all of that, I do wanna spend a little bit of time in this introductory lecture going over some terminology. And I also want to set the backdrop for everything that we're gonna be doing. Again, that's gonna be very data focused and very machine learning focused about discussing some of the challenges that we face as astronomers with astronomical data sets uh, that we hope to apply machine learning methods to. Okay. All right, so first and foremost, I want to define the term features, okay? And features are essentially the measured properties of a source. Features can be numerical or categorical, right? Uh, so uh, as an example, suppose you wanted to classify a bunch of fans that are at a sporting event, okay? Uh, a categorical feature that you might have for all of those fans is that uh, all of the people that are cheering for the Chicago Cubs are wearing blue, and all of the people that are cheering for the Chicago White Sox are wearing black, right? So the categorical feature in this case is just uh, a shirt color, blue, black, right? Uh, other features can be numerical, uh, and this is just any sort of measurement you might make of a source, right? Thinking astronomically, this could be, um, what is the G minus R color of a galaxy? Uh, what is the luminosity of a star that's been measured by Gaia? Features are typically stored as vectors. So everything that you measure, every property that you measure from a given source can then be stored as a vector. And an entire data set, which encompasses multiple sources, will then have a vector of vectors. So essentially a 2D array is how the features are going to be stored. Excuse me. Okay, labels are the outcomes. Okay, essentially the thing that the al algorithm predicts. So in the sports example that I gave a moment ago, a label would be Chicago Cubs fan, or an alternative label would be Chicago White Sox fan. Uh, for an astronomical example, uh, labels that you might have are, this is uh, an elliptical galaxy, or this is a spiral galaxy, All right? So what the machine learning model is doing, again, as we said before, is it's taking the features, those are the inputs, and it's trying to learn rules in order to map from the features to the labels, the outcomes. Uh, labels do not have to purely be categorical classifications. We can also build machine learning models that can handle regression problems. So suppose I want to estimate the temperature of a star based on a number of properties that I've measured with some survey, right? I can pass in a whole bunch of features and then have some what we call regression analysis to get the, the uh, value of the temperature for some newly observed star. Okay. Most machine learning app applications are supervised. This is essentially everything that I have described thus far. And this is where we have, again, known outcomes for a subset of the data. And we wanna map from our feature space to those known outcomes. Um, in unsupervised machine learning, the labels are not known. And we'll have a lecture on uh, both unsupervised and supervised applications later. But in unsupervised learning, the idea is basically, can we can find, we find ways, ways to derive, to derive clusters it. within the data set? Okay. In order to build 
the mapping from the features to our outputs, we need what's called a training set. Okay. A training set is a subset of the data that has known features and labels. Okay, so training sets are used for supervised applications. Um, the reason why I say it's a subset of the data is that if you had labels for all of your data, you would have no need to actually build a machine learning model. But the training set basically, because you have known answers, it's those sources that are provided to the machine in order to learn the mapping. And then once that mapping is known, basically what are the rules to go from the inputs to the outputs, new observations or sources where you do not know the answer or the label can be propagated through the machine learning model in order to get a prediction of their classification or to get a prediction of their regressed value. We typically have a, a number of different metrics that we use to determine how well a machine learning model is performing. And in the simple case where we have a binary classification problem, and there are many binary classification problems that we encounter both in astronomy and generically as part of machine learning, uh, there are four common ways to refer to the outcomes that you get from the classification model. A true positive is when a member of the positive class has been correctly classified as being positive. A false positive is when a member of the negative class has been classified as the positive class. This is also sometimes referred to as the type one error. A true negative is when a member of the negative class has been classified as a negative. And a false negative is when a member of the positive class has been incorrectly classified uh, as negative. This is sometimes referred to as the type two error. Okay. This brings us to our first uh, breakout question of today's lecture. So I want you to just spend a moment discussing with your partner or if you're in sort of a small group of three, uh, what is more detrimental when building a model, false positives or false negatives, okay? And we'll spend maybe two or three minutes discussing this.
Okay, for those of you in the room, if you haven't, if you could wrap up your discussions now. All right, so normally I would try to have a little bit of feedback uh, with all of you uh, following one of these questions, but I think that might be a little bit awkward given I'm on the screen and I cannot see anyone at the moment. So I'm just gonna proceed. Um, I assume, right, I assume that in the discussions that there were probably uh, some of you that were arguing for uh, uh, false positives and some of you arguing for uh, false negatives, okay? And um, I think I think that ultimately the answer to this particular question depends on the problem on which one is working, right? Uh, if you are building a model to detect cancer, false negatives are really, really, really bad, right? We don't want people that uh, have some disease that can be quite debilitating uh, and also have no idea that they have that disease or thinking that they've been tested and do not have that disease, okay? Um, on the other hand, right, suppose that you are building a model to try and find extremely metal poor stars, right? The most metal poor stars in the universe. And in order to actually then go confirm that you have found one of these stars and say, this is a star that's only been polluted by two supernovae ever in the history of its life, um, you need to go obtain a 10 hour spectrum on a eight or 10 meter class telescope, right? To confirm what the model has found. In this instance, false positives are really, really bad, right? 10 hours on an eight meter class telescope is a lot of money. So you wanna be sure if you're gonna make an observation like that, that what you have found is indeed uh, the thing that you're looking for, right? So false negatives and false positives can both be uh, quite detrimental depending on the problem, okay? Uh, so now I just want to talk a bit about machine learning for astronomy, right? Uh, the history of our field, the history of astronomy, is a long story of classification, right? Essentially, point a telescope at some new location in the sky, and there's a pretty good chance that you're going to end up finding something that's never been seen before, okay? And now that you've found this new thing, your goal is to figure out how this relates to all the other things that you have already found, okay? Um, Astronomy is, uh, has been, and I contend will be an observational and experimental led field, right? So the typical pattern is observers find some weird thing or new thing, and then the theorists try to explain what is going on. There are some famous historical exceptions to this. Uh, very recently, there were a lot of predictions about what would be observed if two neutron stars in, uh, merged. And the Kilanova observations that were made a few years ago following the famous LIGO detection uh, actually more or less exactly followed what the theorists were telling us would happen, okay? Um, but uh, with those few exceptions aside, right, astronomy is actually very different from physics in this sense, where theory generates predictions and then that leads to observations, right? So this is like the very famous and recent search for the Higgs boson. General relativity is a theory that first came and then later was confirmed by observations, right? Um, and so machine learning is amazing, utterly amazing at classification and astronomy is built on classification. So high fives all around. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> while I just argued that astronomy is an observationally led classification concern discipline, um, ultimately, like our colleagues that are physicists, what we ultimately hope to do is develop a physical understanding for how the universe works, okay? So for example, here is an image of a galaxy, right? One might build a model that classifies this galaxy as a blue galaxy. Okay, that's great. Uh, and in fact, we can do that. You can build models that 
will tell you, okay, these are blue galaxies, these are red galaxies. Uh, and you can even do that without a direct measurement of the color. Okay. Um, but what we really care about is not that we now have a whole bunch of blue galaxies. What we care about is that blue galaxies are actively forming stars, right? It's that inference that matters. It's that inference that provides us information about the universe itself, okay? So the classification comes before the inference, but the inference is where the understanding comes from. And fundamentally, machine learning is not built to tell us that blue means this is a galaxy where there is active star formation. Again, people smarter than me are thinking about this and there is progress being made, but inference is not something that we get out of machine learning at the moment, okay? So machine learning can provide us with predictions, okay? Our ultimate aim in astronomy is to develop inference, is to develop understanding for how the universe works. Um, in other words, uh, you know, as astronomers, we are data producers, right? We design experiments. We basically say, I'm gonna build a telescope that works in this way. I'm gonna point this telescope over here and I'm doing all of these things in order to understand some specific aspect of the universe, right? Machine learners, right? people that practice machine learning, uh, let's say at the industrial level, are data consumers, right? They just want as much data as they can possibly can get their hands on, right? And they will take whatever they can get their hands on, okay? I contend that this distinction matters. And it means that machine learning is not sort of the perfect application for all problems astronomy, okay? Even though by the end of this week, we will essentially show you that machine learning can solve all sorts of incredibly interesting and difficult problems, okay? Um, other considerations to think about as astronomers. Um, just got to check really quick, make sure there's nobody spying on us. Psst. I want all of you to know that our data sets are not actually all that large. Okay, The deep learning methods that we'll talk about later this week, they really thrive on having gobs and gobs and huge and huge amounts of data upon which to do the learning, to understand the mapping. Okay? And of course, we always talk, especially in a program that is uh, centered around using observations from the Rubin Observatory about how the Rubin Observatory is gonna produce big data and all of that. And it is true, it has a very large camera and there will be a lot of data, but Instagram is a thing that exists, right? Instagram is a thing that exists in the world. Uh, and so are so many other things. Uh, and people working at the cutting edge of machine learning, they have way more data than we have as astronomers, okay? That's another distinction to think about as you consider applying some of these models to your own data sets, okay? Uh, I also, this is like the biggest thing I think that I can emphasize throughout the week, but training sets are very difficult. It's very difficult to build a set of observations that is representative of everything it is that you might observe and try to classify with machine learning, okay? And the reason for this is that labels are very expensive. Um, in a lot of astronomical applications, uh, when it comes to getting cheap observations, so for instance, with the Rubin Observatory, photometry is gonna be cheap, okay? The Rubin Observatory is going to observe tens of billions of sources and will have multiple photometric measurements for all of them. In fact, about a thousand per source, there's gonna be over a trillion photometric measurements at the end of the day in the Rubin database, okay? So the photometry is cheap, but, how do we then build a machine learning model from this data? We need labels. Those labels in optical astronomy typically come from spectroscopy. Okay? Spectroscopy is quite expensive. Um, again, we're getting better, just as we're getting better at making photometric observations, we're getting better at making spectroscopic observations. But we're talking about state of the art right now is tens of millions of spectroscopic observations. Okay? So there's a huge mismatch in terms of uh, what we can do spectroscopically in terms of applying labels to our data. Uh, there's also serious problems when it comes to training sets in astronomy with bias. Okay? Uh, if you just think about a simple sort of black box pattern matching machine, okay, it cannot inherently know about bias. 
So if there are any biases that are present in your training set, those are gonna be propagated to any final model predictions that you make, right? And I will contend that every single training set that is built in astronomy is in fact biased. Uh, and the reason for this is that, you know, suppose you have some new survey, you're looking at the sky in some new fashion. Well, what, what this means is that you're probing parameter space in some new way, okay? So your new survey is necessarily likely to find sources that have not been present in any sort of previous survey. But your ability to classify is going to de be determined by what you know about, which comes from your previous surveys, right? So for example, let's just take some new telescope that's gonna go deeper than any other previous survey, right? By going deeper, this survey will find galaxies at higher and higher redshifts than any uh, previous observations. And uh, at fixed redshift, it will also find uh, galaxies that are intrinsically more faint, right? So these high redshift galaxies, these intrinsically faint galaxies will not have any counterparts in a training set that's built on some previous survey, okay? And so they will be classified uh, incorrectly. They'll potentially be classified incorrectly, okay? So this is known as sample selection bias. I think it's really important that all of you know about sample selection bias and that this is something you're thinking about as you uh, <clears throat> just try to apply machine learning models to your own work, okay? All right, so this brings us to breakout problem number two, the end of the lecture today. Uh, so based on very sound theoretical reasoning, you expect to find the following in a sample of 100 stars, 60 orange stars, 30 purple stars, and 10 gray stars. There's data from some other survey, right? It includes 1,000 orange stars, 200 purple stars, and 14 gray stars. So these are measurements you actually have made, okay? And uh, 14 of the orange stars, seven of the purple stars, and five of the gray stars have features that are missing. So when I say a feature is missing, imagine that that means that for those particular stars, there was no G-band measurement that was made, okay? So I now would like for you to build a model, a machine learning model, to classify stars as either being orange, purple, or gray, all right? What would you do? Again, let's take a couple minutes and you can talk about this with your partners.
All right, if I could ask everyone to bring their attention back to the main slides. I hope you had a, a, a nice discussion. Uh, <clears throat> the truth is um, there is no correct answer here. Given what we know in this circumstance, uh, what I would do is the following. So there's a small number of sources that have missing data. I would just get rid of those. Um, I would then fit an unsupervised clustering model to the data uh, in order to get some sense of whether or not the classes could actually be separated. And if they can't, I would maybe then consider other ways to try to classify the data. For the training set, right, the actual observations, the balance right, is uh, very skewed relative to what we expect theoretically. So I would downsample my training set in this instance in order to have a distribution that looks more like the theoretical prediction. And then after all of that, then I would train the machine learning model in order to make predictions for the new observations that are coming from the new survey. Okay. Um, but this is not right, okay? This is just an approach. Uh, and there are other approaches that may in fact even work better in terms of the final classifications that are produced. Um, and if you had uh, great ideas, I would love it if you could share them in the Slack. Again, I'm sorry that there isn't a, a better way for me to interact with all of you, um, given the current circumstances. Okay. All right. So in conclusion, machine learning algorithms are extremely powerful, right? And I think these things that are happening every day at our fingertips should still amaze us, even though they are routine. Right? Uh, things just like all of the things that happen on your laptop, on your phone, uh, et cetera. I find it very hard to imagine that your work is not gonna be impacted by machine learning one way or another over the course of the next several years. So even if you have no intent of using machine learning algorithms in your PhD, uh, machine learning is going to matter, I would say, at somewhere uh, within your field, your subfield of astronomy. Okay. Uh, machine learning itself provides predictions but ultimately as astronomers, what we want is inference. Right? Remembering that distinction is important as you think about the problems that you work on with machine learning. Okay? And all astronomical training sets are biased. Right? So again, as just a quick warning, it can sometimes be difficult to interpret the predictions that you get for astro machine learning models, given the biases that are present in the training set. Okay? Um, I'm not here to tell you that this means that machine learning won't work. I'm just telling you that these are things that you need to think about uh, in a very serious way, in a very deep way, before you just run off, apply a model and assume that everything you get out of it is good. And with that, I will conclude today's lecture. Thank you. And I'll take any questions you may have. <laughs>